Hey everyone, welcome to my heavily edited AI blog case study. My name is Casey and I'm the founder of bloggingguide.com. Blogging Guide is my website where I share case studies like this one and other digital marketing insights from my portfolio of 25 plus sites. This AI case study was documented on Blogging Guide over the past year and I've received a lot of questions about it. So I decided to put together a comprehensive video outlining how I built a blog with AI generated content that went from $0 a month in January of 2023 to over $22,000 a month in December of 2023. If you want to see more content like this, be sure to like and subscribe to my channel. So just to give you a little background or context as to why I even created an AI generated site. Basically, in November of 2022, ChatGPT came out and sort of upended the entire blogging and freelance writing industry. People were worried about the future of their content. And so I knew I needed to at least dive in and sort of research the idea. Uh, so the concept of this site was basically to establish whether it was possible to create a blog built primarily with AI content but content that was heavily edited by a human editor, which could then be onboarded to a major display ad network. And ideally, I would do this all in under a year. The year was not a fixed deadline, but it was a good goal to have. So some of the goals that I specifically focused on with this case study was getting the site accepted to Mediavine. That was my biggest of the goals. Mediavine's a premium display ad network so I knew that that would pay me well. I've used it before. It generally has really high RPMs. It's not that obtrusive when it comes to user experience with those ads. In order, though, to get in the Mediavine, you need 50,000 sessions a month. So that was the first goal. Second goal was to cover the niche in its entirety with the hope that I would then achieve topical authority. Topical authority is an informal sort of term basically referring to your site being perceived as an authority within your niche. So you write about a very specific topic a lot and cover the topic from every angle, every detail. And even if your site doesn't have the same backlinks from major media organizations, you can still rank well because Google's like, okay, this site's an expert basically on the topic. And in order to do this, I mapped out all the topics I thought would be useful. And there were 750 potential posts that I came up with. And those were the posts I ended up sticking to um, exactly for the first year. And the third goal was to avoid getting destroyed by Google. Google's unveiled a lot of very volatile um, updates this past year. Uh, so I wanted to make sure that I was spreading out my posts, not doing 700 posts, let's say, in the first month. And I wanted to make sure that I was adding value to each post. Each post had its own custom media, so images, video, audio in a few cases, uh, expert quotes, stuff like that. So I wanted to make sure I was adding value and that this was not just like basically spun content. So a little bit about the domain and site that I ultimately built. I purchased the domain in 2021. This was not an expired domain. This was a a uh, domain that someone had purchased and just never built any site on. And the only page that I could ever find when looking through Wayback Machine and other tools like that was the for sale page. So as far as I could tell, there were no attempts to build out this site. It was a catchy, brandable name, which is why I purchased it. But I didn't see any signs. There were no backlinks. There were, yeah, no indications anyone had tried to do anything with this site. But it did have a good brandable name. So that was sort of the theory behind that. I built the shell site uh, on the domain in the fall of 2022. The 
shell sites are basically what I refer to as my like or original site that I build as a placeholder. So I knew I was going to do something for this case study in starting in 2023. So in order to accelerate that initial seeding of content and indexing of the overall site, I decided to launch a generic site that was in the same general niche as what the final site would be but it really was very basic. It contained probably 10 to 15 pages or posts, and most were legal, homepage, blog page, category pages. Uh, yeah, that pretty simple stuff like that. And then there were maybe three to five blog posts. These were very general, high-level posts. The entire goal of building the shell site is purely to skip the sandbox period. And if you do this right, I've had pretty good success. Uh, so I, I would highly recommend that if you're considering just building a site and you have a little bit of uh, lead time. And as far as the actual niche, uh, it's a technology related site. It's definitely a sub niche of technology. Obviously, you can't cover technology in 750 blog posts, no matter how great they are. But this site was uh, a topic I had studied in college. Uh, it wasn't my major or anything, but it was like a, you know, a pretty big interest of mine. The area was sort of up and coming and had changed in recent years, so. While there was content that existed related to this, I saw a lot of gaps in the search result. A lot of the people that really were subject matter experts hadn't written about this type of content in this more practical and sort of updated way. So I definitely saw a gap in the search results. So this section will cover some of the questions I get about the actual content creation process, which again, to be clear, is a mixture of me generating AI generated content and then going back and editing it myself. How important was niche selection? The short answer is it's very important. Uh, you, niche site selection is, is everything. Um, if you pick an overly competitive niche, you as a new site without any backlinks or any sort of brand mentions have almost no chance at surviving. So you need to find something that's fundamentally underserved. And that's the content that Google wants to index, things that haven't been covered before. If you're just regurgitating the same type of content, that's probably not going to be a site that will grow very quickly and it's definitely more susceptible to algorithm updates. As far as uh, what AI writing tools I used, I primarily use Koala and yes, I am an affiliate for Koala now, but I used Koala because the founder of Koala and I, Connor, were on a private blogging forum together and I basically got to see him build the software in real time. We were among a few people who would share messages about the future of, and potential of AI blogging. And he was a software developer who had the skills to actually build a tool. And he was like a traditional niche site builder. So he built the tool very much for people like me and a lot of my feedback and a lot of other well-known bloggers feedback was incorporated into the first version of this. You don't have to use Koala by any means. In fact, you could totally do this all using chat GPT, but it is, a, it's a trade-off. Basically Koala gets you a pretty good first draft with a one click AI content generator. If you did the same process with Koala, with ChatGPT, you'd have to spend, I don't know, several, probably several attempts or several, maybe even several hours uh, trying to format each section and get 
chat GBT to generate the appropriate amount of content. So Koala just sort of takes care of that and it does it at a relatively cheap price. Uh, articles generally were anywhere from 30 cents to 70 cents. Depends on what package you get and how many credits you have. Um, how long did you spend editing each article? This is a good question and one I have received many times. I would generally at the beginning spend three to four hours per article, which when people hear that, they immediately say, well, couldn't you write the article in that length of time? And that's possible. Uh, if I did write the articles, uh, I think it would take probably, yeah, three to four hours at least per article. But I don't think that that's really that relevant here. The The point of editing the article is to add value, but to content that's being produced at scale. That's how this site is going to grow fast, how you increase the content velocity. So yes, it is possible to spend the time writing these articles, but I've written thousands of articles. I'm pretty fast at writing and I still would find this pretty daunting. And there's no question I would have written anywhere near this many articles or invested this amount of time if I didn't see sort of the asymmetric upside of using AI content. And to clarify toward the that was three to four hours at the beginning of the process. Toward the end, I got that time down to one to two hours, maybe even just under one hour in the final stretch of articles. So I did get the time down, but you know, this is not a get rich quick scheme. It takes a lot of time and effort, no matter how you do it. It's just about doing it a little better than someone else and being able to scale it much quicker. Another question is, did this site have a persona? And by that, people probably mean, was my name attached to it? Was there a fake author? And there, it was the latter. There, there was an author profile. Uh, basically, it was a, a freelance writer that had previously worked for me. And they were able to lend their photo and likeness to the site. And I actually did have freelance writers see the initial content, as I'll explain in the next section. But so this was somebody who technically wrote for the site. And we basically just kept using that profile. And how did I build eat related to that person's profile or that persona's profile? I built all the backlinks and traditional social media accounts that I would if I were doing a site. So when I launch a site, I do what are called foundational links. So these are like the basic links that any person who's online would have. So social media, you usually have like Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook. Maybe you have a whole Facebook group. Uh, basically things like that. There might be a couple press releases. There might be a couple directory submissions. So these would be like, business directories that you would submit the site to and the persona's name. Basically, you're just trying to build out that Google knowledge graph. You want Google to believe that your person is indeed a real person. And like I said, this person was real, but they didn't have much of an online presence. So we didn't really have much to go off of. They did have a fiber profile, I think, but that wasn't really enough to convey the expertise in the subject area that we chose. So in this section, I just want to give you a quick breakdown of the costs because in order to appreciate the value of AI generated content, I think you need to understand the cost because that's what really drives up the ROI. So the total cost for this whole project, and this is extrapolated over two years because I paid for some of the services well in advance, was $7,500 which is relatively low compared to a traditional site. So I paid $2,500 for a domain. And again, this was just a, it was a good domain. It was a brandable and sort of clever domain with good keywords, but 
It had no backlinks. It was not an expired domain. There was no significance to it other than it was just a catchy name. And then the next $2,000 was spent on seeding that site with the first 29 articles. And those were articles that I basically had my team or myself write. Uh, I still had a small content team working on the site at the beginning. And I really just wanted to make sure the site got off to a good start. So I wanted to start with my top writers and really make sure that Google understood what the site was intended to be about. And then the biggest cost was the $3,000 that I've spent on basically various Koala credits. Koala is the AI writer I would use throughout this. Uh, I did get like a lifetime discount. So I had like a fixed amount of words I would get per month based on a plan I originally paid in bulk for. But I tried to price this out a little bit so that it would reflect how much it would cost someone today to buy the credits in separate packages. 3000 is actually probably more than I paid in an overestimate, but to be conservative and factor in a few miscellaneous expenses like hosting or renewing domains or other tools you might need, uh, 3000 is a pretty conservative amount. So this section contains a chart that lists all the number of posts I produce per month throughout 2023. And I think I produced a total of about 740. So in January, I did 29 posts. And again, those were the posts that I had a team of freelance writers produce, plus myself, just to get the site off to a really good start. After that, uh, all the posts were 100% AI for the first draft, and then edited by me manually. So you can see there's a little bit of a drop off in February. I'm struggling trying to figure out how to scale AI content production. Anyone who thinks it's easy is in for a rude awakening. I'd say it's much harder than a traditional blog, mainly because there aren't that many people you can hire or potentially outsource the work to. But that was the purpose of this case study. So I pushed ahead and I started to get my systems in place. And by April, I was really churning out a substantial amount of content. The site got accepted into Mediavine in May. So that was the big first push was get to 50,000 sessions. And so you can see it took several hundred posts to get there. So uh, even though that was only five months, it, I, I compressed a lot of content into that time. So basically, yeah, that, that April push was sort of critical. And then after I was in Mediavine, for the next few months, I kind of let things coast. I dropped down the number of posts again because I was really focused on quality. I wanted to make sure that I was only adding really high quality posts and not going too wild with AI content, but also that I was editing and updating old posts. And that's something you need to take into account when you're building a site with this many posts is eventually you'll have a lot of content debt basically that you content that you need to service over time and then really everything scaled up both in terms of traffic and posts starting in q4 or the end of q3 so you see in september pretty much after that it was over 100 for the rest of the year and those are some really big numbers i definitely would never have been able to do that without ai uh, by myself for sure. But even with a team, that's probably more like eight or nine writers full time doing this. So this would have been very expensive had I not used uh, an AI writing tool. This is the chart showing the number of sessions that the site received each month throughout the year. And as you can see, in January, it got a little over a thousand sessions. So nothing crazy to start off. But if you've built sites before, you're probably thinking, you know, that's that's actually a lot in the first month. And it, uh, I would agree it is. It's worth keeping in mind that the site was indexed several months prior. That's why I did the whole shell site thing so that 
you know, I'd already have a few hundred clicks here and there. But also, I added content very aggressively starting on the first of the month. And basically, what this works out to is of those 29 articles that I added that either I wrote or my team wrote in January, basically like three or four of them got several hundred clicks that month. I think one or two of them even got the featured snippet for like a very long tail keyword. So while not anything huge, they were still uh, pretty successful. But obviously you need huge growth to get to 50,000 sessions. If you just continued like with linear growth at, at adding another thousand each month, we're talking close to 50 months. So that would take too long. Um, so typically what you see happen is the site either like triples or quadruples or quintuples several times in those early months if it's going to go somewhere and if you're adding enough content. And sure enough here, it jumps from 1,000 to 5,000. So quintuple there. And then it triples twice in a row from five to 16 and then 16 to 49. And then in May, I hit 50,000 sessions. So I was able to get in the media vine. At that point, I wasn't really concerned with adding as much content. It was more about quality. And you can kind of see that reflected in the traffic numbers. Uh, Google tends to reward, you know, high content velocity. So as the post dropped, the traffic basically like stagnated or dropped a little bit. But come August, September, I was back aggressively posting again. And the traffic also had that, you know, huge leap month over month, going from 113,000 to 283 to 446. And basically, yeah, it finished or its highest point was a little over 500,000 sessions, which was a cool milestone to reach. But basically, yeah, it finished the year, those last three months, really in the 450 to 500,000 range. So even then it kind of tapered off as I finished up the posts. This is a screenshot of my Google Analytics or GA4 dashboard for this site. As you can see, even though the site had reached an impressive 50,000 sessions by May, the given the growth that the site would experience later, it still appears relatively low on that chart. But that's, yeah, that was really the key first part was that hitting that goal in May. The up and downs that you're seeing, if you're curious, that's basically the weekly data. So each point plotted on here is a day. And in my case, Tuesday or Wednesday is usually the peak. And that's the high point you see each week. And Saturday and Sunday is the low point. But in total, yeah, this site ended up generating a little over 2 million sessions. And if you're curious, the drop that occurred at the end of the year is just the normal drop that you see when uh, all the Christmas traffic ends and everybody actually takes a break and goes offline. And this is the Google Search Console graph for the same time period. As you can see, I had 1.72 million clicks, which reflects that I was getting most of my traffic from Google because I think my total was like 2.1 million uh, sessions. So that means that like 80 plus percent at least was coming from Google, basically Google search, uh, meaning it, my results were appearing organically in the search results and people were clicking on my links that way. There was a tiny percentage that came from social media, but nothing to write home about. There, were, there was some level of direct traffic, and there was some level of email uh, or subscriber traffic. So obviously building an email list is just a good idea and a best practice, but 
even then that didn't generate most of the growth on this site. It was clearly Google. As far as the impressions go, I don't think that's that important to really focus on. I know people get caught up on that at the beginning of a site. Yes, you t tend to see impressions before you see clicks and the ratio can be skewed, meaning you have a low CTR at the beginning. But generally, don't worry about that until you get a few months in. But once you're a few months in, I, I would pay attention to your click-through rate, the CTR. Generally, sites that are doing well, and again, I draw this inference from probably having done 60 or 70 sites in total, uh, and from maybe 200 that I've done consultations or audits on, you generally want it between 3 and 5%. That's sort of the typical sweet spot. Uh, that, that means you'll have pretty good growth. You can have higher. I've, I've had sites as high as like 11%, but those are usually super targeted, small traffic sites. I think the, large, the highest click-through rate I've ever seen for a site getting like over 100,000 sessions a month, let's say, is maybe like 6 or 7%. I'm sure there are examples that are higher, but I'm just giving you a reference. And I wouldn't pay too much attention to the average position because 15.3 is consistent with some of my other data, but that can be skewed very easily. For example, almost none of my articles were probably actually ranking position 15 throughout any of this. It was probably a, at the beginning a small percentage and toward the end a large percentage that were ranking on page one in positions one through five. Um, and then basically the rest were probably like 30 plus. So I, this can be very easily skewed and I wouldn't put too much weight into the average position. So now we're at the display ad earnings per month. And again, I didn't use any ads or any monetization basically uh, until May of 2023. So that's why January, February, March, and April are all zero. So you can see like, you know, I generated a lot of content before I even got to that first dollar. And this is sort of an exceptionally fast site. So that's why I tell people that, you know, blogging is, is definitely a very slow way to generate income. If you need income fast, you should not pursue blogging. But if you have time and you're willing to plan things out and you eventually want passive income, meaning in like 18 to 24 months, blogging is a great way to make money and display ads are a really great option for monetization. So the first month, May, that actually is not probably representative of what it would have been. It's probably disproportionately low because I was only accepted toward the end of May, so that, but that period was $914. June, it gets up to where, again, where it probably should have been the previous month had I had the full month of data, about 2,700. July drops a little bit, but you can see basically May, June, July, and August are all kind of in that mid to upper 2,000, 3,000 range. Um, and then the traffic and the RPMs start to go up starting in September. And that's the perfect combination. So you see that huge jump from 2,900 to 8,400. That was pretty amazing. And I thought that was kind of, I thought at that point, maybe the site would cap out at like 10, 10K a month um, come October, November, December. You have to remember in September, there was, the helpful content update, and then there were several core updates in the following months. So it was very volatile. So I thought the site could even drop. I was I would have been pretty happy if it had stayed at even the 8,000. But the site was never hit. As you saw from the previous traffic graphs, it more or less continued to grow at a similar rate. So October is 14, almost 15,000. November was 21, and then December was 22. So you can see this is the full trajectory 
of a site that was, again, the first per- post was on January 1st, 2023. And the last post was, yeah, the I think the 31st of December. So this, and these are the entire earnings. So zero to 22,000 a month. Again, I've done this many times. These results are not typical, but I think that it was the AI content that allowed this to happen. And, and that's partly why I shared this case study. I believe something like this was possible, but I thought the numbers would be an order of magnitude smaller. So I thought it'd be a few thousand by the end of the year would be like when I got into media vine. So the fact that I was able to produce so much content, even though it wasn't an impossible amount of content, the fact that I could produce so much content and it was so cost effective, that's what leads to this kind of crazy high ROI. So this is a screenshot from my Mediavine publisher dashboard. And you can see that throughout 2023, the site earned a little over $76,000, which is a lot. It's I don't know many sites that do that in their f- first year without using like an expired domain or merging a bunch of domains or redirecting or whatever. So that that's a lot. And the other thing to kind of note there is that the site does have pretty high RPMs, $37 average across the year. Now, granted, at the probably the first four months, the RPM was probably in the teens but or even less, but the bulk of the traffic occurred toward the end of the year. And that's also when the RPMs were highest in Q4. So those few months of like $40 RPMs, 40 some dollar RPMs, maybe 50, almost 50. Yeah, really boosted the site. So this is a comparison of the costs associated with uh, an AI generated blog versus human written blog. And this is pretty important to understand because this is sort of, I think, where the two really diverge. So the cost per article for a AI-generated blog were, was about 30 to 70 cents per article. It depends on how much, how long the article is and what package of AI credits you pay for. But I have a pretty good network of freelance writers and probably better than the average blogger. And even then, I probably would be paying $50 to $150 per post if I was paying a writer to do this. Obviously, that's an immense difference. I mean, that right there kind of says it all. But to get a little more granular, the payback period, meaning how long it takes to actually recoup the total amount of your investment, is about eight months if you look at my earnings charts for this AI site. Typically, if a site goes well, and there's no guarantee, but if a site were to go well and get on Mediavine, but in a more reasonable timeline, it would still take 25 to 35 months to fully make back that amount you initially invested. So not only is it three times faster, but you're spending you know significantly more time exposed because if your site were to get hit by an algorithm or some sort of penalty, uh, there's 20, 25, 35 months, a long time. Anything, anything can happen. Eight months, your site's probably pretty safe, especially if it's a new site. So the exposure is less. And that's reflected in that next box there where I have total site cost and which is basically the maximum you can lose on the site. Had the site been hit anywhere in that eight month period before it achieved total profitability, the most I could lose is 7,500 on a traditional blog. If we're assuming a hundred dollars conservatively a post, that's a total spend of 75,000. So you can lose a lot more money on that site and it takes a lot longer to recoup your investment. And it's just much more expensive all around. So these are some of the big differences between the AI and traditional blog. 
So now I'm going to cover some of the frequently asked questions that I got from a lot of readers about this site. Uh, these are good questions. I tried to pick some of the better ones. If you have other questions, feel free to drop a comment and I'll do my best to get back to you. But um, the top questions, did you build any links for this site? And the answer is no, I didn't build any links for this site. Uh, I tried to keep this site as sort of white hat as possible because at the beginning I wasn't sure how Google even viewed AI content. Building links also for a site that is going to grow rapidly and really early to see like that kind of up into the right movement is pretty risky. Um, I'm not saying don't build links, but this site did not have any built links. They were all passive, naturally acquired links. Next question was, what prevents someone else from using the same strategy? And this is a good question. A lot of people dismiss AI content because they say, well, if that person can do it, all I need to do is find the same topic, use the same software, processes, and boom, I can replicate that. So basically, yeah, the, the, this site really isn't going to survive is what they're intimating. The truth is that it's actually very labor intensive to build an AI site. And that's basically what you're seeing people discover right now. I see people in other niches copying sites and eventually what they figure out is like, if you don't edit the AI content, your site's going to get crushed. Uh, not because Google has a problem with AI, but just because it's going to be derivative. So the biggest moat was the fact that first I spent one to four hours per post times 750 posts. So that's several thousand hours on this site. Yes, you could do that yourself, but we're talking about like a, at least six month project if you're doing this full time. And that's a lot of risk for someone to do this for six months full time. And it's a lot of just sheer work. That's not like a shortcut. You might as well pick a niche that you actually enjoy and that there ha is no competition in. That would be a much smarter strategy. You could, have, could of course outsource the editor work to someone, but again, there aren't that many people with experience and the few that are, are not gonna work for you for cheap. They're all out there building their own sites. But if you wanted to attack a site like this, you'd probably have to do an elaborate link building campaign, just sort of hope that you don't get hit and you'd have to pay probably five, 10K a month for 12 months of that. So, I mean, I spent 7,500 in total. You'd be spending, you know, nearly six figures out of just on the link building side. So, yeah, if someone wants to do that, you know, if someone has a couple hundred thousand, they can always go after something, but most people don't have that. So it's not really a specific concern for this site. Why do I think that the site has survived all the updates? And by this, I assume they mean Google's algorithm updates. It's a good question. The site had basically all the best practices done. I mean, I do run a site called Blogging Guide. So I perfected the site speed. I used the lightest theme plugins, hosting, everything possible. So it was sort of, years of my combined experience testing products and all that, plus the fact that it had crazy content velocity. We're talking 50 to 150 posts per month, but it's also not unbelievable. Like top sites with a team of writers can publish 50 to 150 posts per month. And that's what I do on my human generated sites, but that's with the team of like 10 writers. So, I think that the fact that this site produced so much content in this underserved niche is really the key. Uh, it was both able to establish topical authority really quickly, but it was also just the only option Google had really to rank. There weren't that many people going after this, not in the same way at least. And I included lots of media, expert quotes, 
there was just a lot of work put into this. Sort of everything was done basically by the book. So I think there's an element of luck, but I do think that, you know, having audited a lot of sites post helpful content updates, I've very few sites are really well constructed. I mean, almost every site has major flaws in the site architecture that I see, like uh, just the amount of like broken links or lack of internal links. I mean, there's so many things that I see wrong in sites that I audit. It's very hard and very rare that I, for me to find like a perfect site that got destroyed. I'm not saying that didn't, didn't happen. That definitely did happen. There was some collateral damage in these updates. This site was in growth mode, and when you're in that growth mode and Google loves you and your site's relatively new, you tend to get a lot of flexibility. And then the key is continuing that growth, so getting the links and basically, yeah, widening that moat so that once Google does start paying more attention, they'll, you know, no matter what article they look at, they'll see, okay, this is updated this is the best article on the topic, etc. And so the, I guess the final question was, can this still be done today? And the answer is definitely yes. I've actually launched four new sites in 2024. So I'm experimenting with the ratio of editing and the ratio of custom images and all the things that take time. But I'm very confident that this works, not just because this site is still working, but because these new sites are already ranking. I'm using the same method and they're not even aged domains. They didn't have a shell site. So they're literally like fresh domains. I just found registered on Namecheap like and started a site a day later. So they're, they're pretty good testaments. If those can already get a few hundred clicks in the first month, then and like the ones that are now like two or three months old or at like the thousand mark, that's, that's a similar growth, you know, curve. Do all of them have the same ceiling as this site? I don't know. Probably some have a higher ceiling, but they're much harder. Some probably are much more narrow, but we'll find out. That's the point of experimenting, but you can definitely still do this today. And I come across lots of sites that are successfully doing this today when I'm just looking around at sites on Ahrefs. So people are doing it today. So I would definitely encourage you to give it a shot. Thanks for watching my heavily edited AI blog case study. I hope you found some useful tidbits in there. If you want to learn more or follow the process uh, in real time, you can check out bloggingguide.com where I post monthly updates. If you want more sort of digital marketing insights and just uh, various kind of news updates in the blogging space, uh, my Substack newsletter, Blogging Guide, is also probably a good resource. And if you have any potential partnership ideas, Feel free to reach out on either social media at Casey Botticello or go to my website, CaseyBotticello.com. I'm looking for high domain authority uh, partnership sites where basically I can add on blog content to your existing site. Maybe you have an e-commerce store or something, but you don't have any blog content and at no cost to you, I can take the risk and start generating content and we can do a revenue share on all the additional revenue that is added through this site. So there's really no risk to you and it's a pretty good win-win deal. Thanks again for watching this video and be sure to like and subscribe.